I've stated a number of times, publicly and in writing, that you will never find a preacher, a theologian, a Bible expositor, an author, a pastor, you'll never find anyone who believes in the error of replacement theology who is not also wrong in their other doctrine in some fundamental way. I know of no exceptions. We can think of Israel and the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews as something of a litmus test. Being right about Israel, understanding the prophetic purposes of God for Israel, and I apologize to those who have heard me say this, being right about Israel, doctrinally, theologically, does not prove somebody is kosher. There are many people who understand God has a prophetic purpose for Israel who are right off the rails. Most of the messianic movement is unfortunately taken over by extremist elements, people who are trying to put Gentiles under the law. There are Christian Zionist organizations who think they can bless Israel without Christ and just have a social political gospel and are quite prepared to let Jewish people continue on their way into eternity without salvation from their Messiah and just say, we love you. Being right about Israel does not prove somebody is right about other things. But it is a litmus test in that I've never found anyone, and I don't think you will either, find any figure who is replacement theology who is not fundamentally misguided or off in their other doctrine. I'm not looking to throw mud or throw stones. I'm just stating facts. We had a great preacher in Britain who went to be with the Lord in the late 19, in the 1970s. He was the last truly great British preacher probably in the tradition of people like Charles Spurgeon, Campbell Morgan. The last one was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Truly a great, great Bible expositor. And he, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the Queen's personal physician. He, he was a medical practitioner. He warned 40, 50 years ago that there was something wrong with another major British preacher, and he warned publicly. He warned people there's something wrong with John Stott, well, John Stott was indeed replacement theology, and not only replacement theology, but anti-Israel. But then he wound up writing books telling people there's no such place as eternal hell, and the church can't tell people that they're going to be sent to an eternal hell. Then he went down the ecumenical road, etc., etc., etc. Most unfortunate indeed. Uh, we had somebody in America who teaches that we have to unite with Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists, even though they worship other gods, in order to bring in global peace. Now that's the agenda of the Antichrist. Moses called other gods demons, Shadim. Paul called other gods demons, the Manoi. But you actually have people saying you have to worship other gods, uh, unite with people who worship other gods to bring in global peace. This is what he publicly teaches. I speak of Rick Warren. That's what he teaches. It's on his website. It's in his book, Global Peace Plan. I'm not attacking. I'm just telling you what he teaches. Um, the fact, well, John Piper promotes his ministry in the American Midwest. John Piper is replacement theology, among other problems. I've never known of anyone who subscribes to the errors of replacement theology who was not fundamentally misguided in their other doctrines in some fundamental way because they are fundamentally misreading scripture. They are misreading scripture fundamentally. If you're misreading it about the purposes of God for Israel, you're misreading it about other things. If God is not obligated to keep his promises to Israel and the Jews, neither is he obligated to keep his promises to the church. Remember, Jesus never made a covenant with the church. The church has no covenant of its own. There's no such teaching anywhere in scripture. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, I will make literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like that one I made with their fathers. The new covenant would be made with Israel and the Jews, according to Jeremiah 31. 
Paul, writing about this in Romans 9, says to the Jews, belongs, present continuous active in the Greek, still belongs, theotiki, not covenant, the covenants, both the old and the new, still belong to Israel and the Jews. If God is finished with Israel and the Jews, he's automatically finished with the church because he never made a covenant with the church. Non-Jews are grafted in. Now, Jews who don't believe in their own Messiah are cut off from their own olive tree, as it were. Unless they repent and believe, they'll be grafted in again. But the olive tree is the promises God made to their fathers patriarchally. Do not believe replacement theology. And do not believe anyone who tries to suggest to you that contemporary events in the Middle East are not of prophetic significance. We cannot be 100% dogmatic about it, but just looking at what's transpiring even this very week, it's not far-fetched to fathom that the stage may be being set for a Gog and Magog scenario along the lines of Ezekiel 38 and 39. The countries that were at the center of world events are at the center of world events again. Not that that hasn't happened before, but this time the Jews are back in their land. Two very brief passages. Uh, let's look at three. Turn with me, please, to the end of Matthew chapter 23. Weeping over Jerusalem in verse 37, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets, who stones those who are sent to you, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is from Psalm 118, from what's known in the Hebrew liturgy as the Halal Rabbah, the great praise. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barach nuhem, mi bet Adonai, hodu la Adonai, ki tov, ki le olam chazdo. Hoshana, Hoshana, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or if you like the Roman Catholic Vulgate, the Latin Bible, uh, Benedictum qui veni in nomine dominum. It's always been there. <laughs> The Jews must be not only in Israel, they must be in Jerusalem for Jesus to return. He said it directly. In Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, Luke 21, 24. He makes this clear. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until... The time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Fulfilled, platero, Gentiles, ethnon. A time will come when the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, and the Jews will be back in Jerusalem and in the context in control of the Temple Mount in some way, which they presently are not, but obviously they're in control of Jerusalem. Speaking in the first person by the Holy Spirit to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 12 of Zechariah, verse 10, Jesus says, they will look upon me, who they have pierced, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And this tells us this will happen, will be epicentered in Jerusalem. At least three times, Jesus directly and personally made it clear the Jews would be back in the land and be back in Jerusalem. But then you have not only a lie, but a ridiculous lie. Nobody would suggest that an Eskimo or an Inuit Indian can occupy the northern Yukon. Nobody can suggest that. Most Canadians are not Inuit Indians or they're not Eskimos, but nobody would say that Eskimos have no right to live in the Yukon. Why? Because they're the indigenous people. They were there first. Nobody would ever suggest that Apaches have no right to live in Arizona. I have no objection to Euro-Americans or Afro-Americans or Asian-Americans or Hispanic-Americans living in Arizona, but don't tell me an Apache has no right to be there. They were there first. Nobody would say that a Maori cannot can, can be an occupying presence in New Zealand. 
The Maoris call the people who came from Britain, they call them the Pakia. Now, they can live there, but you can't say that a Maori has no right to be in Rotorua. Why? They're the indigenous people. They were there first. An Irishman cannot occupy County Tipperary. By definition, an indigenous people cannot be called an occupying presence unless they are a Jew. There are two standards. Two standards. Archaeology doesn't lie. Politicians lie. Left-wing academics lie. Left-wing journalists lie. The religion of Islam is a lie. They won't lie. But archaeology just tells the truth. We know from the scriptures, Abraham was there from the time of the Canaanites. You go dig on any tell in Israel. Tell is a, a, a mound with multiple strata from buildings and rebuildings over periods of centuries, even millennia. The further you dig, when you can't dig anymore, you find the oldest ones from the time of the Canaanites onward were Hebraic, were Israelite. They're the indigenous people. Nobody can deny this. The archaeological record supports the historicity of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. People will say, oh, you Christians and you Zionist Christians and you Zionist Jews and whatever, you're forcing your religion on other people and your beliefs on other Archaeology proves that the Israelites, the Hebrews, are indigenous. It is Islam that's forcing its religion on other people. The archaeological record shows Islam has no claim as an indigenous people to that land. None. None. There were civilizations there before the Arabs. There were civilists, the Byzantines, the Romans. <laughs> they have no claim except this. Islam divides the whole world into Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, the world of Islam and the world of the sword. And the teaching of the Quran is once they conquered something, Allah, their God, has given it to them. Therefore, they're entitled to it. And you have to accept their religion. That's the only basis for the claims of Islam to that land. You must accept our religion. I can put my beliefs on a shelf and just look at the academic archaeological evidence. The Israelites are the indigenous people. Nobody can argue with that. But this is not the first time that the Jewish people have returned to that land. It's not the first time. It's the third time. It's the third time. The first was the Exodus. Having left in the period of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they returned from Egypt approximately 420 years later. That was the first time. Third time is the modern rebirth of the state of Israel, but the second time is what we read in the book of Nehemiah. Now, in the Hebrew canon, Nehemiah and Ezra are basically two halves of the same book. Turn with me, Will, if you will, to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, as some people prefer to call it. Nehemiah, Nehemiah. The people come back to the land, and they left something in Babylon. What they left in Babylon was their mother tongue. Most people could no longer speak the Hebrew language. Most people could no longer speak the Hebrew language. The scholars of the day were known as the Sofrim, Sofrim, the scribes. What they actually did, it came from the Hebrew word lispor, to count. They counted the numbers of letters and verses and the numerical value of the letters. Numerically, they used out the numerics. And they knew the mathematical value of every verse in every book to maintain accuracy in copying the transmissions. They used mathematics to guarantee accuracy in transmission is how they did it. 
Well, this was long before there was a Septuagint in Greek or before there were what we call the Targums in Aramaic. There was a problem. Few people knew their own language. We read this in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. And they read from the Torah of God, the law of God, translating or explaining to give the sense so that they understood the reading. There is only one verse in Scripture, only one verse in exegetical context that speaks to the issue of Bible translation. Only one. It's common sense, and it's something that God only saw fit and saw a need to inspire to be included one time in his word. This is the only verse in Scripture that in its exegetical context, without twisting or reading something into it, it doesn't say, but that explicitly and exegetically deals with the issue of translation. And it tells us the priority is always on the original meaning of the original language. The original meaning of the original language. Now, I have no problem with the King James as a translation, but it's not perfect. It has errors. But be careful of people telling you that that's God's gold standard. It's not. There are errors in it. I can prove it. From both Greek and Hebrew, I can prove errors. Has God blessed it and used it? Yes. Is it flawless? No. Is it God's gold standard? No. It's the original meaning of the original languages that's God's gold standard. Secondly, there's a dispute. Literal translations as opposed to dynamic equivalence. Well, you've got a problem to give the sense of the original meaning. When the New Testament quotes the Old, it usually, usually, not always, but usually, follows the Septuagint, the Greek. And the Greek is, the Septuagint is not a literal translation. It is dynamic equivalence. It tries to communicate the idea, the meaning. Again, I do not attack the King James or those who read it. God has blessed it and used it. But be careful of King James onlyism. It is completely, completely ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And those people who are proponents of it, inevitably, very few of them can read Greek or Hebrew themselves. Very few can even read the original languages themselves. But they're dogmatic about something what they don't know what they're talking about. That's, again, not to attack the King James. I've got a couple of copies of it myself. It's beautiful for its prose, but it's not God's standard. The original meaning of the original languages is his standard. That, however, is only one important feature of this book. This book of Nehemiah speaks about the subject of revival. That subject of revival. In that same chapter 8, we see something. When the people began to repent and seek God, and God began to move among them, they gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate with the living water. The Maim Hayim was brought in. Maim Hayim, we're told, living water is a figure of the Holy Spirit, according to John chapter 7, as Jesus had said, and John chapter 4, etc. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law, that is the scroll of the Torah, and they read it all day long. Whenever you have a genuine revival, a genuine move of God, people will revert to the serious reading and study of Scripture. John Wesley said Methodism would be dead within a generation when he was an old man. And the reason he said it would be dead is because Methodism was beginning to neglect the reading and exposition of Scripture. Now, I'm not a cessationist. I do not believe the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles. That is a mistaken way of thinking. It's an erroneous teaching. It's false. However, one of the reasons the charismatic movement has failed to bring revival, has not revived Western society, one of the reasons is they threw the Bible out the window and went by feelings and experience. The Lord showed me this, God told me that, all this nonsense. If there was a real move of God, people would go back to the serious reading and exposition of Scripture. Unless you see that happening, there's no real move of God. There's no real move of God. 
or if there was, it's been undermined by experiential theology. You know, I tell the story. I remember in 1968, in my wayward youth, when I was a hippie, I was not saved. And two religious movements, two spiritual movements, began in 1968. In 1968, the charismatic movement kicked off. It had roots as early as 1966, but it kicked off in 1968. And it said it was going to renew the church. They called it the charismatic renewal, and it was going to renew the church for Jesus. That same year, I remember the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came from India to London, England, and then he went to Bangor in Wales, in the north of Wales, to the university, and he gave a series of lectures attended by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the pop icons of my generation. And the New Age movement was born. Eastern religion came to the Western world, and it said it was going to spiritually transform Western society. Well, let's see, from 1968, we're coming up to nearly 50 years. Let's be generous and call it 48 years. <laughs> is the Western world, is Vancouver more Christian now than it was 48 years ago, or is it more New Age than it was 48 years ago? <laughs> That's true all over the place. The only thing that has failed more miserably and shamefully than the charismatic movement has been its leaders. That's not to say that individuals were not saved. Individuals were saved. But the movement was a failure. And it was not God's fault it was a failure. There's a number of reasons for that failure, but the first, experiential theology. People did not return to biblical doctrine, to sound teaching. And I say that as somebody who believes in things like tongues and prophecies and healings. I don't believe most of what we see today is real, but I certainly believe there is a real and authentic as in the scripture. Well, that's another aspect of Nehemiah. It's a book of revival and how revivals really happen and how they don't, or what happens when they do happen and what happens when they don't. But it also speaks of the Jews coming back and those people who meant them no good. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite officials heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. A third figure was Geshem the Arab. There were people who did not like the Jews coming back and rebuilding the land. Now remember, the land was more or less devastated, almost completely, almost completely. It was not a land flowing with milk and honey as it had been. The judgment of God came on them, first with the Assyrian captivity in 721 B.C., then in 585 B.C. with the Babylonian captivity, and it was no longer a land of milk and honey. It was a land under the judgment of God. But it stayed that way until the Israelites came back and began to rebuild it. Modern Israel is the same way. They don't tell you that per square mile, the majority of modern Israel was either desert or swamps and marshes that was infested with malaria. Before they were drained and made aggregable by the Zionists, there was nothing there except malaria, plasmodium vivax. The Turks put a tax on trees. There were no trees. It had to undergo national reforestation. There was nothing there. There was nothing there. There's a lot of things they won't tell you. One thing they will never tell you is this. They'll never tell you something that they can't defend. From 1948 until 1967, Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. They were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. From 1948 until June of 1967. May of 48 to June of 67. The West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, Golan Heights were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. 
if they wanted another Palestinian Arab state, in addition to the one they, they said they already had in Jordan, if they wanted a Palestinian state in Gaza and the West Bank, why didn't they just make one when they had nearly 20 years to do so? Nobody would have stopped them. Nobody. Not only that, but when the petition happened, they said, they said, there is a Palestinian Arab state called Jordan, even though it has a Hashemite Bedouin government. In 1970, 1970, King Hussein of Jordan said that Jordan is Palestine. In 1968, Yasser Arafat said, Sorry, 1960, yeah, 1960, Yasser Arafat said, Jordan is Palestine. They admitted that they already had a Palestinian state. Between 70 and 72 percent of the population of Jordan is Palestinian Arab. Now they say they want a two-state solution. They've always had a two-state solution. What they're asking for is a three-state solution. But they really don't want a three-state solution because Hamas controls the Gaza Strip and because the Palestinian Authority controls the West Bank. So now you're up to a four-state solution. Except they don't want the four-state solution. Hamas admits it's only Hudna, not Salim. It's not real peace. It's only Hudna, a temporary ceasefire until we can get the strategic advantage to continue the Jihad. They say this openly. In other words, if we get a Palestinian state, we're going to take all of it. Allah has given it to us. Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Hab. They openly admit this. Yet the United Nothing, United Nations, the crooked politicians in Washington and Europe, anywhere else, they all know this. I didn't have much of a view of Voltaire but he was right about one thing. History is the lie everybody agrees on. History is the lie that everybody agrees on. It's all revisionism and lies. Well, one of the characters who were quite nefarious and meant them no good was Tobias. It's interesting, he had a Jewish name, Tuvia. Like in Fiddler on the Roof, means the goodness of Yahweh. Today there are many people with Jewish names, like Susan. Shoshana, or Daniel, <laughs> you know. There are many people who have Jewish names, Matthew, Matetiao, you know, or John, Yohanan. Many people have Jewish names. But that doesn't mean that they have any affinity for Jews. <laughs> well, let's look. He always meant them evil. Let's look at this guy with a good name. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came about when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors of the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent the messenger to me. Come, let us meet together at Shepharim in the plain of Ono, but they were planning to harm me. There can be no peace with fundamentalist Islam. Fundamentalist Islam teaches the doctrine of tahwid, permissible lying. The Jehovah's Witness cult has the equivalent, by the way. Permissible lying. You're allowed to lie to the infidel because it's not seen as a lie. It's simply military disinformation in the jihad. Permissible lying. When they speak English, they say, we want peace. When they speak Arabic, they don't say Salim, they say Khudna. We want a ceasefire until we can get the strategic advantage. <laughs> Just following the example and teaching of Muhammad. Of the 57 Islamic countries in the world, of the 57, not one of them, not one of them, 
will give Christians or Jews the rights they have in Canada. Not one of them. People are always talking about Palestinian rights. What rights does Hamas give to Arab Christians in Gaza? You don't want to know. You don't want to know. You know how many Christians have been butchered alive in Iraq and in Syria and in Lebanon by Hezbollah? Nobody says a word. I was in Saudi Arabia a few months ago. You know what it's like for Christians in Saudi Arabia? It could be a death sentence to become one. Nobody says a word. Nobody says anything. Even in more moderate Arab countries like Jordan and Egypt, you wouldn't want to be a Christian. To say nothing of what they've done to the Christian population in Sudan. They've killed 3.4 million over a 17-year period. Nobody has said a word. So instead, you've got to find the one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights and religious freedom of Christians, that's Israel, and gang up on them. <laughs> it's not even logical. But God sees the injustice. Well, let's continue. When they say dialogue, let's meet. They always have an agenda. Now, ultimately, Israel will make a false peace covenant with the Antichrist. It's called a covenant with death. Having rejected the true Messiah, Yeshua, they'll accept the false one. They'll make a covenant with death. Two-thirds of them will wind up being exterminated as a result of this covenant with death. Be careful when your proven enemy says, let's meet. These things don't work. After the Oslo Accords, the suicide bombing and terror multiplied dozens of times worse than it had ever been. After Oslo, after the Oslo Accords, they got multiple times, dozens and dozens, for every person killed before Oslo by terror, another dozen at least more were killed after Oslo. It's Hudna. It's Hudna. They always have an agenda. Well, let's look at verses 17 and 18 of this chapter. And in those days, many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letter came to them. We'll come back to that in a moment. These things are there, but they're not only lessons for Israel's past. They are lessons for Israel's present and Israel's future. But what about the church? What about the body of Christ? These same principles co-equally apply. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 6, speaking of the Exodus, these things happened as examples for us. These things happened to Israel. Verse 11, these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction. The history of Old Testament Israel, according to 1 Corinthians 10, and Paul repeats it. According to Romans 15, he repeats it again was written so the church would not make the same mistakes. Romans 11, we're told the same thing. If, he didn't, if God did not spare the natural branches, he's not going to spare Christians who are not natural branches. The Jews didn't get away with this. Norwegians and Filipinos aren't going to get away with it. It's a repeated theme in the New Testament. Learn from the mistakes of Israel or the same thing will happen to you. And so we begin with the Tobiah, an ancient enemy who always has an agenda. An ancient enemy who always has an agenda. 
my family is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. As a kid in New York and New Jersey, I went to a Catholic school and to a Jewish community center. My wife, both her parents are Jewish, they're Holocaust survivors, our children are born in Galilee, etc. My family are Jewish, but growing up, I saw two cultures. I understand the way Jews look upon Christians and upon Christianity, and I understand the way that Christians look upon Israel, Jews, and Judaism. I see both perspectives co-equally. I see both perspectives. Traditional enemies remain traditional enemies. What they tell you and what they tell each other are two different things, just like Islam. For instance, do we have any former Roman Catholics here, people who used to be Roman Catholic and you were born again and you left the Roman Church? Put your hand up. Okay. If you were to look at the official documentation of the Roman Catholic Church from the Council of Trent, and you were to read the, Vatican, the Second Vatican Council documents, the declarations of the Council of Trent are reiterated by the Second Vatican Council. The Roman Church remains the one true church, and although they change the language saying you're separated brethren, they say if you leave the Roman Catholic Church, you're in mortal sin, and you are hell-bound, etc. Their doctrines are the same. A very different gospel. The New Testament teaches the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Roman Catholicism teaches you atone in purgatory for your own. The New Testament teaches we're saved by grace through faith, the second birth. Roman Catholicism teaches we are saved by an ethereal substance known as sacraments, ex opere operato rituals. When you have dialogue, let's meet, let's talk. This is how it works. The Roman Catholic theologian, usually a Jesuit, will say, welcome, and the Protestant, usually a nominal Protestant, but sometimes an Roman uh, an evangelical who's dodgy and ignorant of what Roman Catholicism really believes, will say, we are saved by faith. We're saved by grace. It's all grace. And the Jesuit will say, yes, we're saved by grace. Now to a Protestant or to an evangelical, grace is a gift. That's what the word means in Greek, charism. In Hebrew, grace is chesed, God's mercy in the covenant. In English, it's undeserved favor. It's nothing we merited. In Roman Catholicism, Grace is an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments. They have actual grace and sanctifying grace. Oh, the Reformation was a mistake. We're really brothers. We can be one. We both believe we're saved by grace. Yeah, but they have two entirely different definitions of grace. It's like witnessing to a new ager. I've witnessed to many new ages, especially in Hawaii. You tell them... I was born again, they'll tell you they were born again. They were reincarnated. You tell them you saw the light, they saw the light. The cosmic illumination of the inner self. You tell them you have the Holy Spirit, or they have the Spirit. The zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. You tell them you believe in sin, or they believe in sin. That's giving place to bad vibes. <laughs> they'll use the same... You're giving place to negative energy. They'll use the same terminology you would use, or I would use, but they'd mean something entirely different by the terms. This is what happens when you get into interfaith and ecumenical dialogue. Sanbalat means you know good. Geshem means you know good. Either does Tobiah. Now, if they can't defeat you outwardly, they try to make inroads internally. An institution, perhaps 45 minutes drive from where we are seated, is Regents College. Professor, an eminent professor from that college, a Calvinist, 
He endorsed Peter Kreet's book, Ecumenical Jihad. Peter Kreet's book, Ecumenical Jihad, said, we have to have ecumenical union with Islam to morally redeem society. Endorsed by Chuck Colson, endorsed by the most prominent of professors at your very own Regents College. It's frightening. No problem. Let's have dialogue. Watch out for Sanballat. Watch out for Getchum. And watch out for Tobiah. What makes Tobiah uniquely damaging is that he has a good name. Let's look again at Nehemiah 6, verses 17 and 18. Again, many letters came. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arach, the son of Yehohanan, and married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Moreover, they were speaking about his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. Then Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Notice he has an agenda. Everything is undergirded with subterfuge, but it's masqueraded with good works. Good works in Scripture are represented by fig leaves. Like in Revelation, the fig leaves are for the healing of the nations. But remember Adam and Eve sowed the leaves together to try to justify themselves when they were fallen. People will always use fig leaves. They will always use good works, social gospels, to masquerade their true agenda. There's nothing wrong with good works. But there's something wrong with going against the teachings of Scripture. Again, I'm only stating facts. I'll give you two examples. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, if you want to know who the professor was, it's J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer endorsed a book saying, we have to have ecumenical union with Islam to save society. Okay. Well, this is what it is. Uh, when she got the Nobel Prize, Mother Teresa of Calcutta stated, she doesn't convert these people to be Christians. She converts them to be better Hindus and better Muslims. Go to hell, go directly to hell. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. She wanted to make these people better Hindus, better worshipers of Rama, Sitra, Shiva. These are her own words. I'm only quoting her. How dare you say anything about that godly woman? clean somebody up off the streets of Calcutta and let them die without Christ instead of giving them the gospel? The problem was not with what she did, but what, what she didn't do. I quote the present Pope Francis. If two men are in a same-sex relationship, who am I to judge? Yeah, who are you to judge? But God has already judged. Read Romans chapter 1. He's a godly man. How dare you? I'm only going by what he said and showing you what God says in his word. But he has a good name. Yeah, Tobiah. Tobiah always has a good name. Not only does he have a good name, he has good deeds. The ultimate setup will be the Antichrist. I explain this in my book, Shadows of the Beast. This is the ultimate setup. Remember, whenever you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something about the Antichrist. Only two people are called the son of perdition, Judas and Antichrist. Only two people are Satan-possessed. Many are demon-possessed. 
but only two are Satan, satanically possessed, not demonically, satanically. Of Judas, it says Satan entered him, and of course, the Antichrist and false prophet. Both into money, big time. And when John the Apostle explains, children, it's the last hour, Antichrist is coming, he explains Antichrist in the character of Judah, of Judas, doesn't he? They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. There's a reason. Son of perdition. Whenever you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is trying to show us something about the Antichrist who's coming. What did Judas do? When you read the Gospels synoptically, it wasn't only Judas. It says some of the disciples. Then it just said the disciples. He got them all believing him. Could this not have been sold and given to the poor? <laughs> he didn't care about the poor. He had his own agenda. He just used the plight of the poor to ingratiate himself with people and to con people. And he was good at it. Up to the last moment, the apostles didn't know, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? The Antichrist, the son of perdition, will be the same. He will be so good at it, until Jesus reveals him, we won't know it's him. Not even the elect will know it's him until Jesus reveals him. What's he going to do? One of the things he's going to do is what Judas did. Use a social gospel. Pretend to care for the poor. You know how many organizations that are spiritually bankrupt that began as gospel preaching charities? World Vision, totally anti-Zionist, spiritually dead, ethically dead. World Vision. I wish it drops dead. But it began, right? Most of the Salvation Army, it began right, but there are fewer and fewer believers in that organization with every generation. Samaritan, Christian Aid, all of these organizations were founded by truly saved believers. Harvard University, Princeton University, these were founded by believers. That's what it is. A social gospel. He's going to use signs and wonders and all this other stuff, but he's going to use a social gospel. If people can't see through obvious false teachers and false prophets, if somebody lacks the discernment and doesn't have the knowledge of God's word, to know what's wrong with the purpose-driven lie, or to know what's wrong with Benny, Kenny, and Joyce. They're never going to see through this guy. If you can't see what's wrong with Benny, Kenny, and Joyce, you're never going to see through this guy. He's going to be too good. But he's going to have a good name. And he's going to do good works. If possible, the elect will be deceived. But he'll have an agenda. Let us unite with you. Let us work together. Now notice part of the problem was personal loyalties were eclipsing loyalties to the word of God. The problem in this situation has a lot to do with intermarriage. Marriage with non-believers. Marriage with non-believers. That was Chuck Colson's problem. Well, let's look further at this. Look with me, please, to the other half of this book from the Hebrew canon. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin, in verse 1, heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, the heads of the father's household, and said to them, Let us build with you, for we, like you, seek your God. We've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esar Hadon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's household of Israel said to them, You have nothing in common in building a house to the Lord with us. Nothing. 
The king of Assyria is a metaphor for the devil. Now what happened when the ten northern tribes went into captivity? Assyrians were brought to colonize northern Israel and they intermarried, producing a hybrid Jew called Samaritans who rejected most of the scripture, who changed certain passages of the Torah to make Mount Gerizim seem like the holy mountain instead of Mount Zion. <coughs> and their belief system was a hybrid of the scriptural and the pagan. Much like the Eastern Orthodox Church or the Roman Catholic Church, it's a mixture of a distortion of the New Testament with pagan influence. That's what it comes from. The emperor of Rome was called the pontiff, the pontificus maximus, the bridge builder between all religions. Have any religion you wanted as long as you acknowledge the pontiff. What used to be uh, Diana of Ephesus became Hail Mary full of grace. The early church never believed this stuff. It just became more and more seduced through this hybrid. But in Ezra we read, the faithful people of God stood up and said, you have nothing in common with us. Let us build with you. We can work together, Catholic and Protestant. They don't... <laughs> okay, but I have to ask you a question. You say you're a Christian. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you have to atone in purgatory for your own? Oh, you don't love Catholic people. My mother is a Catholic person. She's on her way to hell with a scapula around her neck because she trusts in that instead of in the blood of Jesus. Don't leave that old Polish lady or that old Irish lady or that old Puerto Rican lady or that old Lithuanian lady on her deathbed with rosary beads praying to the dead, afraid of going to purgatory when boldly she can approach the eternal throne if she came to the second birth. That's not love. That's sick. That's ecumenical poison. That's not the love of Jesus. It's religious emotionally charged religious idiocy masquerading as the love of Jesus. I love Jews. My family are Jews. I want them to be saved. I love Catholics. My family are Catholics. I want them to be saved. I love Arabs. They're the cousins of the Jews. They're also the children of Abraham. I want them to be saved. Compromising with a lie is never going to bring anybody salvation. Remember, many people, many people, I've met many people, you probably have as well, but over the centuries, only God knows how many. Many people have been saved, have been born again, have become regenerate just by reading the scriptures. Nobody even witnessed to them. They, they just read the scriptures and they prayed and they got saved. Many people have become believers just by reading the scriptures. Nobody, nobody has ever picked up the scriptures and read it and become a Jehovah's Witness. Nobody has ever picked up the scripture and read it and become a Mormon. Nobody has ever picked up the scriptures and read it and become a Roman Catholic. Nobody. There's no purgatory. There's no poetry. <laughs> well, let's continue. They tried to get in. The dragon and the serpent in the book of Revelation. Satan always has two modes of attack. The dragon is the persecutor. That's external. The serpent is the seducer. That's internal. The serpent beguiled the woman. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians? I fear lest you become deceived by the serpent the way Eve was. She's a picture of Israel and the church, vulnerable to spiritual seduction. And you see these people saying things, Oh, we just have to love. No, no, no. That's not what God says. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray, 
that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. You want love? You want the love of Jesus? It requires knowledge of doctrine and discernment. Otherwise, you won't have the love of Jesus. You'll have cheap religious garbage that's worth nothing other than deceiving people. It's of tremendous value to Satan, but it's of no value to anybody else. The love of Jesus requires knowledge and discernment, or it's not his love. It's a counterfeit, and a cheap one at that. Oh, you're judgmental! I didn't write it. I just believe it by the grace of God. Oh, let God judge! He has judged. Can't you read? We just need to teach the truth. God will take care of the error. In that case, rip out Galatians, rip out 1 Corinthians, rip out 2 Corinthians, rip out Thessalonians. They speak a lot of empty religious nonsense. It's not reality. This is reality. In the last days, these issues come to a climax. When you see the Jews back in Jerusalem, it's the last days. Let's look just a little bit further. Turn with me, please, to chapter 13 of Nehemiah. On that day they read aloud from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assemblies of God. Now that's not to say people who are not Jewish could not become part of the community of faith and worship God, but they would have had to do it the way Ruth did. She was a Moabitess. Your God is my God, your people my people. She would have had to convert to the belief in the God of Israel and stop worshiping these demon idol gods. Because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Moreover, our God turned the curse into a blessing, so it came about that when they heard the Torah, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Your ancient enemies will always remain enemies. Islam will always be the enemy of Christianity. Talmudic Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism, Rabbinism will always be the enemy of Jewish believers. Roman Catholicism will always be the enemy of biblical Christianity. They may change tactics. They may say, let's have a dialogue. They may come as the serpent instead of the dragon but the same folks who gave us the inquisitions. <laughs> have not changed their agenda. Verse 4. Now prior to this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah, again at this time, intermarriage was a big problem. Look at verse 28 of this chapter. Even one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite, so I drove him away. Intermarriage with non-believers is a whole problem in itself. But notice what happens here. Personal and family loyalties come into play. He had prepared in verse 5 of chapter 13 a large room for him where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, the tithes of grain, wine and oil prescribed for the Levites and singers and the gatekeepers and the contributions for the priests. But during all this time I was not in Jerusalem for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, Artashasa in the original text, I'd gone to the king. After some time, however, I asked to leave from the king and came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashiv had done for Tobiah 
by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. When Tobiah gets in to the house of God, something happens. No fewer than seven times, using various Greek terms, oikos, hegios, naos, heron, no fewer than seven times, the New Testament identifies the church as the temple of the Lord. Jesus being our high priest. No fewer than seven times. You bring in Tobiah. He has a good name. He does good deeds. And he's related to me. <laughs> What did Jesus say about he who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, but it goes beyond that. I know people who will remain in churches they know that have gone into apostasy. My wife likes it. Now, the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. You're supposed to be the spiritual head of the family in marriage. You are her protector. God's going to hold you accountable for not getting your wife out of it. And if she doesn't follow you, God's going to hold her accountable for her rebellion. Oh, my children like the Sunday school and the youth group. Oh, my God. I'm only telling you the truth. I'm only telling you the truth. I've got a seven-year-old and a couple of kids here. I can't tell you the whole truth. I better not. You would not believe the scandals going on related to sex and things like Hillsong. What they are teaching, what they are doing. How many evangelicals are caving in on homosexuality? Major leaders in Britain, America, Tony Campolo, Steve Chalk, the Houstons and with Hillsong. And the things they're coming out with. Youth are being swallowed up by this. A generation, I can be specific, but it wouldn't be appropriate. We have too many kids with us. A generation ago, or less, pastors and youth ministers used to tell Christian parents, get to your children about sex before the world does. I'm warning you, get to your children about sex before the backslidden apostate church does. Get to your children about it before Hillsong does, before the Houstons do, before Tony Campola and his son do, before Steve Chalk in England does. Get to your children before the backslidden apostate church does. I wish I was joking, but it's no joke. I wouldn't joke about that. Personal relationships, personal loyalties take precedent over loyalty to the Word of God. If somebody is not loyal to the Word of God doctrinally, they're not loyal to God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Real worship stops. Jesus wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. He says the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. As I once heard someone say in Ireland, there's no doxology, no doxology without theology. In other words, if the lyrics of the hymns are wrong, God does not accept the worship. You go through the vineyard hymnal, many of the things sung in the Vineyard Movement in their hymnal of the lyric are not scriptural. That river song from that Pensacola, not a, not a single line of it, not a stanza, is scriptural. Hill song the same. The Lord does not accept the worship if the doctrine of the lyrics is not right. I'm not talking about styles of music, but at least you know what John what Charles Wesley did or Fanny Crosby, it's right what they wrote. It's scriptural what they, what they composed. Well, let's look. 
a large room where formerly there was grain offerings and incense the utensils and tides of grain for the priests and Levites, the singers. You bring in Tobiah, real worship goes out the window. So does the grain. The only way you can host a border like Tobiah is to get rid of this book. Oh, you can read a verse or two out of context, and then tell anecdotes and stories. Remember, what used to be preaching, what used to be exposition of God's Word, feeding the sheep, in popular circles today, that has degenerated into motivational speaking using Christian jargon. That Mars Hill is based on it, that the... They don't have the grain. They read the message. The message is not even a valid translation of Scripture. If this is Rick Warren's Bible of choice, the message, Eugene Peter, it's unbelievable. You can read Greek, the thing is absurd. John 1.14, in the beginning was the word, word and archei kai logos. In the beginning was the word, John verse 14, and the logos became sarx, the word became flesh, and dwelt among us. The word is katheskeno in Greek. In other words, the same God of the Old Testament becomes flesh, and then by his spirit dwells among us. This, and, in the person of Jesus, that's him, he's physically those. And the messenger says, the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. <laughs> It bears no relationship to the original meaning of the original language, as Nehemiah said it should. Yet people think that's the Bible. There's people who read that. There are Bible study groups. Bible study groups will read a book by a guy who says, Jesus did not die for sin. He does not believe in substitutionary atonement. He rejects propitiation. His name is William B. Young. The book is The Shack. By his own profession, the man is not a Christian, does not believe in Christianity. He does not believe in it. He does not believe Jesus died for our sin. And there are Bible study groups that read that book instead of this, instead of the Word of God. Throw the worship out the window. Throw the grain out the window. Instead of anointing, they have hype. Instead of worship, they have entertainment. Instead of exposition of God's word, they have motivational speaking and anecdotes and telling stories. And when you challenge it, even if you get the people, yeah, but that'll disturb my relationship and my friends go here and my wife likes the church and my husband went here. When Nehemiah came back, he said, throw that guy out. The eviction of Tobiah. Kick him out. I'm only stating facts. Here in Vancouver, J.I. Packer, the preeminent Reformed Calvinist theologian of Canada, endorsing a book saying we have to unite with Islam to morally save society? Don't take my word. Read it for yourself. Ravi Zacharias getting on the platform with Mormons, not telling the truth that their Jesus is not our Jesus. Their Jesus, according to the Book of Mormon, is the spirit brother of Satan. Oh, how dare you say that about Brother Ravi? I've been so blessed by his ministry. A lot of people were 25 years ago. I'm only telling you the truth. What do you do when the leading Baptist, conservative Baptist pastor in the United States? Please do not take my word. Go on YouTube and watch him. Says it will be possible to worship the Antichrist worship Satan and the person of Antichrist, 
take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven in direct rejection of Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. When the leading conservative Baptist preacher of the United States, probably of North America, publicly and in the media says you can worship the Antichrist, effectively worship Satan, sell your soul to him, take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. Don't believe me. Go watch him. His name is John MacArthur. We've got to get rid of Tobiah. Forget about loyalties to friends, to family, unless we're first loyal to the Lord on the basis of his word, our loyalties to others are not even real loyalties. If we're not loyal to Jesus, we can't be loyal to others with the loyalty of Jesus. Tobiah must be evicted. But to get rid of Tobiah, you have to get rid of any Ashiv. You have to get rid of the so-called leader who brought him in. Just on the ecumenical issue. Don't listen to Rabbi Zacharias. Talk to somebody saved out of Mormonism. Don't listen to the International Christian Embassy. Talk to somebody saved out of Orthodox Judaism, Rabbinism. Don't listen to ecumenical evangelicals. Talk to an ex-Catholic. Eli Yashiv must be confronted. If God is going to move, if his house is in any way going to be restored, Eli Yashiv must be confronted. And Tobiah must be evicted. God bless. Have a good evening.